It's time for a new perspective with your host, Pastor Mike Sherbineau, with your daily dose of how much Jesus is with us. If you're ready for some inspiration and help getting through these tough times, then listen in today as Mike interviews a whole host of people from all walks of life, thought leaders, seekers, and followers, all to hear God's voice who speaks in all languages. So sit back and relax, and don't worry, this isn't a show about what you need to do to be loved by God. It's a show about a whole lot of good news. From a mighty church just outside of Toronto, here's Mike Sherbineau. Hey, we're glad you're with us again today. Have you ever wondered, does God answer prayer? Well, we're going to be talking about that in just a moment with a, a friend of the program, Dr. Gary Onick. But you know, Holly, welcome to you again. Yes. This has been a fun week. It has been. Yeah, it's you've been put great. up with me very well. <laughs> Thank you. It's been the caffeine and hydration mixed together. <laughs> mixed together and it's all work day. Eh? Exactly. Well, hey, we, I do believe in miracles. So, mm. um, But you know, this is mental health month. Yes. And I'm glad that we're able to talk about it. Yeah. It still carries a stigma, but not the stigma that it once did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so before we jump to our guests, I just want to say to you as a viewer today that if there's something that you're struggling with, uh, check out some of our programs because many of our speakers talk about their journey with mental health, including Rachel Barbo, who's written extensively on it. And we'll see some of her clips all this week. I want to encourage you in this journey called life. Don't give up press on, and discover that God is with you. And someone who discovered that is uh, Dr. Gary Onik. And Gary, I want to welcome you back to the show today. And with a special guest, Danielle, we're going to introduce her in a moment. She's speaking for her mom. But we'll come to you, Danielle, in a moment. Gary, uh, just take us back. You're uh, a surgeon, a researcher. Uh, cancer is the enemy that you try to fight for so many of your patients but you've gone through the journey yourself. Just refresh our memories of that amazing story. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I've been working in cancer treatment for a long time, and, and a lot of the things that we've done have, have become part of the landscape. Uh, and we had always concentrated on just killing, you know, localized cancer in a better way. And uh, uh, about almost eight years ago, uh, we had an idea that would allow us to treat patients that had cancer everywhere. So, and those patients uh, basically are uh, incurable and uh, yeah, all of them uh, eventually are going to die if, you, if the cancer has spread to your bones and your lymph nodes and your liver and your lungs. So what we uh, came up with was a way to make an, a vaccine out of a patient's cancer. And we could do it in about an hour inside their body. So it was very simple on how to do it. And uh, we did it on, a, on our first patient. Uh, and this was a fellow who was basically gonna die. He had about eight weeks to live, he was in hospice. And we did it and all of his cancer went away. Wow. And that, and that basically said to me, um, and by then I really had a faith. I, it took me a while to come to a faith. Um, it took a whole process, really. And, but by then I had faith and I said, you know, if a higher power, if God is trying to let me know that this is something I have to pursue, this is the way he'd do it. Because if I had had one or two failures right from the very beginning, I probably wouldn't have, have done it and pursued it because everyone said it couldn't be done. So, um, and so, it, so this was the underpinning. And then uh, approximately four years later, um, I get the diagnosis that I've got the exact same disease that I had been working to cure with this new treatment. And so I had cancer all over my body. I had, uh, mine was prostate cancer. And so um, I uh, enlisted friends uh, and a wide prayer network to bring in that aspect of it. And uh, I found a friend who was willing to, to actually do the treatment on me while I was still awake. And I helped him <laughs> do the operation on myself. Uh, and uh, yes, it was bizarre. We, we had some, there were some laughs during that. And uh, there had to the, be laughter in that. I mean, my goodness. Oh, 
yeah, I mean, you, you couldn't, you could not laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, uh, as it turned out, within six weeks, uh, I had no cancer. So, uh, you know, within, within six weeks, I had no cancer. Mm -hmm. And my PSA, which is a measure of cancer, went from 137 to 0.6. And, uh, you know, I haven't had any metastatic cancer uh, since that time. And uh, so, so I knew, I mean, think about it. Somebody said to me, uh, what are the chances that you would be given the disease that only you could cure mm -hmm. and you are cured? What, is the, what are the chances of that? And basically I said, okay, I've now been given a mission. I've been told that I need to. It's almost like a covenant. I, I've made a covenant. I have to pursue this because it's uh, too important to, to mankind to, to not. And uh, so that's my story. Gary, I mean, it's a powerful story. I've shared it with many friends, uh, and I never cease to be amazed at it. And we're talking about prayer. And I just thought, as we talk about that, I want to weave that throughout the conversation. But I'm going to ask Holly to uh, talk to Danielle and find out the whole connection that she and her mom and their family have had with you. So let's do that. Holly, yes. I'm going to flip it over to you. Thank you. Danielle, I'm curious to know, how did you meet the doctor? How did you and your mom uh, go through the process of battling cancer together with Dr. Onik? Thanks, Holly. So basically, my mother was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer um, back right before Thanksgiving and pretty much got a death sentence from every other doctor that we spoke to. And... Um, my brother-in-law is a radiologist who met Dr. Onik at a medical conference and said, hey, this, this is our doctor. He's doing cutting edge things. He's helping people. He's doing things no one else is doing. Um, but it was the opposite of everything that every other doctor was telling us. So we were scared. And at this point, we had no hope because we were um, my mom had gotten only a few months to live. And so when we met Dr. O, he renewed our sense of hope um, and he brought the, our family together. We basically hunkered down at my mom's house for a month after she got her initial treatment. And we prayed, we meditated, we stuck together as a family unit. And six weeks later too, about six, seven weeks later, we went for her first PET scan since her treatment and we were blown away, just blown away. We couldn't believe it. And, and I, I was uh, telling Dr. Onik that I call her my miracle mama. I mean, I got her back. Um, so we're very grateful. Well, we wanna talk more about that. We've got a lot more to hear in a minute, but first we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna be right back. Welcome back. An incredible story from both our wonderful guests, Dr. Gary Onik, as well as Danielle, whose mom was one of the recipients of the incredible treatment that Dr. Onik is working on. I'm, I'm curious, though, because Danielle, you were explaining how within six weeks, your mom's cancer disappeared. And so, Dr. Onik, when it comes to what that looks like, what would that mean from a medical vision, a view? Well, I, I think you can see that... Uh... Up on the screen, there it, there's a scan that demonstrates what the findings were in Daniel's mom. And mm -hmm. if you start over at the right side, 
you can see there's this uh, green circle and that's surrounding her primary tumor. And then if you look and there's the, the liver and there are all of these bright circles that uh, outline each, basically each one of them is a tumor. So she had more tumors in her liver than really you could count. Wow. And uh, this is usually fatal within, you know, six, eight weeks. Uh, in the center one, that's after six weeks, by uh, the center box, you can see that all of those bright areas have faded. And it's hard to see them. And then mm -hmm. if you go to the left side, there are no bright areas anymore. And the tumors are completely gone. And the tumor that was her primary tumor surrounded by that green circle is also gone and the pancreas there looks normal. So uh, you know, the whole process took about three months to show that you know, there was finally what we call a complete response. Yes. And what's, so, so you know, that's remarkable in itself, but, but what our experience shows is that when our patients get this kind of response, they, they, this is a long-term response. It's not like you get chemotherapy and you know it's coming back because right? it doesn't cure anybody. This is such that uh, uh, just like me and, and the first patient, the first patient that we treated that I told you already about, he's eight years and he has no evidence for disease. So I fully expect that um, uh, you know, Danielle's mom is going to do well um, in the long term. Yeah, it's amazing. And I know, too, that patients who have a prayer support around them also do well and often will recover better. Danielle, what was your experience with prayer, and how did that help your family navigate your mom's healing process? I think that the focus on um, prayer and family and togetherness really gave us connection to one another, a uh, connection to Dr. Onik, something greater than ourselves. And um, it really brought us all even tighter, closer together. And it made the process a little bit more manageable. Yeah, some hope in the mix. And I know, Dr. Onik, your nickname is Dr. Hope as well. As a physician, as a doctor, how does prayer play into your practice? Well, I think it plays a, a huge uh, part in it, in that um, there's no question that um, physics and quantum physics shows that all of our consciousnesses, consciousnesses? Yeah, conscious, consciousness are, are connected. Uh, and that what we feel and think about our consciousness affects other things and other people. Um, and that's, that is absolute, that is quantum physics. There is no um, fight over that. And so what is prayer? You know, prayer is us connecting to each other as well as to that higher power. And so it's, it's critical. It's also critical in that um, your mind is also, and your consciousness is connected to your body. And so the things that your consciousness um, deals with can absolutely have an effect uh, on your health and on a disease you have. So uh, there's, I, I see that the patients who have a faith um, do better. Um, and uh, you know, we are connected as a doctor and a patient, and I can have a better uh, chance to affect um, you know, their health in that way. Kind of, kind of sounds kind of you know, out there, but uh, you know, this is science. And, and science is what, I mean, I was in a, a scientific atheist for the longest time, most of my career, until I started seeing these connections. And if you listen to patients and listen to their experiences um, and do some reading on the science of it, 
Uh, you know, there's no question that there's an awakening now uh, that, uh, to the fact that there is a God and we interact and uh, uh, that's the hope for, you know, patients, but it's also hope for mankind in general. That's powerful. Okay, I'm going to jump, Gary, from you for just a moment. I want to talk to uh, Danielle. And, you know, as the months have gone by now since your mom's healing, uh, what place does prayer have in your life right now? And, and what have been some of the impacts upon your family? I mean, it has been truly amazing. It's like being given the gift of um, appreciation of life back to all of us um, and to our family, to the grandkids, and to just remember to count your blessings and be grateful for everything you have. We are also grateful to Dr. Onik and for everyone who prayed and support us and supported us through this. So now it's just, it's like being renewed um, and, and we couldn't be happier. We just couldn't be happier. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And as our viewers would know, I'm a person who believes, and I know Holly does as well, in the power of prayer. I believe that God hears and answers prayer, not always the way that I want at times. I was sharing that in another program, but I've also seen his divine healing uh, over and over again uh, as we've prayed specifically for people and some who haven't recovered. I also believe that God has met them in a very real way and they've encountered his peace because Gary, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, there's two things we can count on, someone has said, death and taxes. And we know that uh, one day our lives will be over, but I live with the hope that when my life is over, I will be with my Savior. Um, how do you wrestle with the fact of eternity and as a doctor, and have you discovered the, the fountain of youth yet that we can all have a drink? You know. Uh... I, <laughs> no, I haven't found that. Uh, just look at my face. You know I haven't found that. Uh, but the, uh, I think that uh, there's nothing that happens in our lives that, that doesn't happen for a reason. Um, I think that uh, even Alexander, I, some of your viewers, I, I point uh, them to even Alexander's work. Um, where his book is Proof of Heaven. And, um, you know, he is basically like a modern day prophet. You know, he had a terrible uh, illness, he recovered from it, uh, which was miraculous. And he has, um, you know, things to tell us. And one of the things he tells us is that number one, nothing happens here that's not supposed to happen. Um, and that um, there is, uh, you know, a glorious heaven uh, after this. So, you know, I look upon myself as, you know, if a patient is uh, supposed to survive, uh, then I, that's what I'm helping. You know, they're not going to do it without me. Um, but, you know, that's my job to help them survive. And if they don't, I, I know that they're going to a better place and that that was the time, you know, for them to do that. And I, I hope that they have the faith that they know uh, that that's what, um, you know, is in store for them. The, pa the patients that I see that have a faith just handle the whole uh, situation um, of, you know, having a, a death sentence, uh, whether we can get around it or not, um, uh, so, so much better. Uh, you know, if you're an atheist, you know, you're holding on to every moment here because you think there's nothing, you know, beyond this. And, and that's kind of sad. And um, I don't think you have as much chance of getting, you know, your results that you'd like for more time if you don't have, you know, that faith. So, well, Gary, you know, speaking of time, we have that problem with the clock. We've ran out of time. I want to do a follow-up much sooner. It's been way too long since you've been on the show. We've got to do another follow-up conversation to this. I just want to thank you for being with us. I want to thank you, Danielle, for joining in and sharing the amazing story of your mom. And we are so happy 
for all of you. And uh, in a few moments, I'm going to be talking and completing the subject of what we've begun today. So thanks for joining us. Stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back. For those of us who follow Jesus, we have a book. It isn't a theology book. It isn't a rule book. This book is a story, the story of God and humanity, a story Jesus said he was fulfilling. This book contains poems, riddles, letters, puzzling narratives, and new ideas. Yet, throughout it all, this book is full of the breath of God. For those of us who follow Jesus, this book is a treasure. This book is a tree of life. This book is a page turner. Turn the page with us. Well, Holly, what stood out to you on that conversation? I mean, there had to be about 40 things, but uh, yeah. pick one. What didn't? Um, there's an incredible cancer treatment out there that stood out. Um, how closely related science is to our faith. I know sometimes we look around, we go for a walk, and we see God in nature. But here, Dr. Onik has a chance to see God in our bodies and how prayer impacts it. It's yeah. incredible. So impactful, and having Danielle share about her mom, just, mm -hmm. you know, it's another story, it's real. I encourage people to go, just Google Dr. Gary Onik, and he talks about his own surgery. It just, I kill myself laughing on that one. Yeah. Uh, I have a few family members that are in the medical field, and they're just scratching their head. But in the midst of that, God answered his prayer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge starting point. Like, Gary would tell you that there was at one point he didn't believe. Yeah. And then for his own surgery, he, he asked people to start to pray for him. And we've had some powerful conversations. And we might not be exactly aligned on the same page, but we're pretty darn close. And we've become friends through this journey of just hearing and sharing and watching where God brings us. Mm -hmm. You ever notice that? You could be over here. I might be over here. And he's bringing us to a place where we see and discover truth. Mm -hmm. and that's so important. Yeah. And I'm going to come back in a moment and share with you the truth of what happened to four guys when they brought their friend to Jesus and experienced a miraculous healing. Stay with me. So do you need a miracle today? Maybe as you're listening to Dr. Gary Onik, you're thinking, I got to talk to that guy. Uh, I've got cancer. I've got some illness. I need help. There's probably not a time in our lives when we don't come at least once to that point where we say, I need help. I need someone greater than myself. As I've been teaching through uh, the book of Luke chapter 5 this past week, the story of the man who was paralyzed, of his four friends who said, we're going to get you to Jesus. And they do the most audacious thing. I mean, they have a dilemma. Their friend can't walk. There's another dilemma. There's the size of the crowd that's right in front of them. They can't get through the crowd. And they're thinking, it's no way. And maybe it's not a crowd, but maybe it's something that's keeping you from getting the desired result that you want. Well, guess what? The four friends made a decision. They take their friend on the mat that he's lying on. Obviously, they would take each a corner. And they're going to carry him. Probably not an easy feat in itself. They decide they're going to climb up the outside walls of this house. And then they look at the flat roof and they say, we're going to open it up and we're going to drop our friend right at the feet of Jesus. Now, all the technical aspects, I don't know how they did it all, but I can only imagine, imagine the people being below who are crowded in to see Jesus, like going to your favorite concert. And somebody comes and says, excuse me, get away, even though you got front row seats. I'm going to get even closer. They're saying, how dare they? But they did dare. And they said, we've got to come to Jesus. Over and over in the scriptures, we find stories of people who said, doesn't matter what happens. I've got to have an encounter with Jesus. 
Woman said, if I could touch the hem of his garden, of his garment, I will be made whole. There was another man who was a leper, and he called out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this man lands at the feet of Jesus. His friends decided to do something. You know, when I think about their decision, um, maybe it was Nike that got their inspiration from these four guys who said, we're just going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to make it happy. Perhaps you're in a dilemma today and you know you have to make a decision, but you haven't. Friends, no decision is indecision. Do you need to make a decision? Then make the decision that leans and brings you closer to Jesus. That will be the right direction. If it takes you further away, don't do that. And I think the other decision these guys made was we're prepared to get dirty. It's not going to be easy. They're, they're sweating. They're, they're dragging their friend up the stairs. They're clawing back the dirt. Nowhere does it say they have a shovel. They certainly didn't bring in an excavator. And sometimes in life, things are dirty. Things are messy. Maybe you're aware of people that need help and say, oh, I don't want to get involved with them. But is God calling you to do that? That dilemma that you see, is he calling you to intervene, to be his presence? And you know, these guys were determined. They weren't going to stay on the sidelines. They were going to go to the front of the line. And in life, I know we're called to be meek. We're called to be generous. We're called to be loving. We're called to be kind. But when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, be in the front of the line. Say, no matter what, I'm going to seek after God. It was like Joshua who said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It was King David who said, one thing I desire of the Lord, and that's what I will seek after. And what was that? To be in the very presence of God. And prayer brings us into the presence of God. And as you seek for God, as you seek to know him, he'll reveal himself to you. And he is able to bring to you the miraculous healing that you need. And if you don't get the healing now in this life, you will in the life to come. But you can trust him. And he will be your peace that passes all understanding. I want to invite you to pray with me right now a simple prayer of trusting in Christ. Would you pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm asking you to be my savior, my healer, and my friend. Forgive my sins. In your name I pray. Amen. And if you've prayed that simple prayer, would you write to me today? Don't delay. Write to me right now at the perspective. TV. You can just write Mike at the perspective.tv and I will get back to you right away. God bless you.